Hey everyone, uh, thanks so much for joining me this morning. Um, in a previous career, I used to attend Creative Mornings and was really into the donuts and um, inspirational talks. So it's really surreal to be here right now and also an honor, so thank you. Um, if you're wondering how to pronounce my name, it is Grichelle Falasgan, as you can see here. Um, <laughs> and I'm a photographer based here in Portland. Um, much of my work is in the bicycle and outdoor industry. And today, I'm going to talk to you all about my path to becoming a professional photographer and how the bicycle has been a, an essential tool to my career. So, quick backstory. Um, I grew up in Stockton, California, and from a very young age, I was obsessed with documenting the world around me with a camera. Um, it started off with these little point-and-shoot cameras, and then eventually, when I was 13, I got this super cute little Minolta SLR from my mom. She got it at a garage sale. Um, she probably paid 10 bucks for it. So as part of my youth, I did not grow up playing sports. I, didn't, I was not very athletic. I could not run a mile to save my life. Um, and, you know, any, any time I did something mildly strenuous, I was constantly out of breath. In high school, I knew I wanted to study photography and become a professional photographer. But it didn't really seem like an attainable or, you know, lucrative career choice. For one thing, photography school was expensive, and I'm sure it still is, and there was no way my parents were going to support it. Um, and to be honest, I don't think my parents really supported anything me, in me doing something creative or artistic. <laughs> um, and secondly, I didn't really have anyone in my community um, who was a working photographer, so I had like this very narrow-minded view of what professional photography looked like. You know, look, it, you were either like doing fine art and you did like gallery shows or shot weddings, or maybe you were like a local newspaper paper photographer, and I knew those were things I didn't want to do. So I gave up on the idea and spent the next couple years after high school and community college trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. So while working at a coffee shop, I actually discovered the concept of graphic design. And it was really exciting. You know, like it seemed like a very happy compromise. Um, I get to use photos, typography, color, like all these things I was very excited about. And most importantly, it seemed like, you know, I could still be creative and have a lucrative career. So, after this little aha moment, I left Stockton and moved to San Francisco to pursue graphic design. So while I gave up on my dream of becoming a pro photographer, I never gave up on my camera. You know, for years, I shot both film and digital. Um, film was really exciting. I love experimenting with like cross-processing. Was really into like shooting Polaroids with peel apart film. And technically, you know, we call them Polaroids, but it was made by Fuji, <laughs> whatever. Um, but it was fun. And in college, I saved up and bought like a mid-range DSLR so I could take like nicer, high-quality images. Um, during my time as a graphic designer, having photo skills really worked in my favor. You know, there. Through the various studios and tech companies that I worked with, um, there would be times where an art director would be like, hey, you know how to shoot photos, right? We're on a really tight budget. Will you work on this thing for us? And I'd be like, yeah. Um, so you know, I would do these little projects and like go back to my desk all super stoked and be like, ah, oh, I just got paid to make photos. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> And so, you know, I kept creating images for myself and sharing them on Flickr, on my old design blog, and eventually I started getting these little random photo gigs. So while that is all happening, um, sorry. <laughs> so while that is all ha happening, I started riding bikes as a way to get around town. Um, you know, I really hated depending on public transportation and Driving and parking was just not going to be a viable option in a place like San Francisco. And, you know, it also wasn't very eco-friendly. So I started commuting everywhere by bike. And, you know, my commutes to work were fairly short. They were like three and a half miles each way. But by the end of the week, you know, I was totaling like totaling 35 miles. And for me, that was like really exciting. You know, like that just seemed like a lot. So. So this thing with the bicycle started off as something very practical and utilitarian and eventually turned into something greater. 
you know, because I was starting to feel fit and healthy um, from all my commutes, I decided to focus on bicycling as uh, my form of exercise. For years, I had struggled with finding a workout that would stick. You know, um, I tried running, I tried boot camp, I even tried Tai Bo, and like none of it, like, like I was really into. But with bikes, I was having a ton of fun pedaling around and exploring parts of the Bay Area that I'd never been to before. So, you know, on the weekends, I'd started going on these long bike rides, riding anywhere between 30 to 60 miles, and eventually got really into racing cyclocross, like obsessed with it. And so, like, through riding bikes, I discovered this inner athlete in me that I had no idea existed. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't grow up playing sports. I didn't do anything athletic. So this was, like, this new me that, I, you know, it was very exciting. Um, you know, I felt like I was going from zero to crushing big climbs in the Bay Area. And it was, like, really life-changing for me. Um, so then, like, I started train. Um, sorry, back up. I got to breathe. <laughs> I hope I'm not talking too fast. <laughs> um, so, you know, you know, this is like life changing. And, you know, before all this, I would used to look at these like big hill climbs, these big mountains and think like, oh, there's no way to ever get to the top of it. But, you know, I started practicing. Um, I started training. And like, most importantly, I just like put myself out there and tried. And you know, sometimes it would take me a while, but sure enough, eventually I'd get to the top. And once I got to the top of the climb, I really felt accomplished. And, you know, I really felt like I could do anything that maybe that I am capable of more than I had previously assumed. So, oh yeah, sorry, I gotta show this slide. So, you know, I've got like commuter me, there's like training me, and then there's cycle cross me doing this goofy things on the weekends. Um, so this is all happening around like 2011, 2012-ish, and mobile photography was on the rise. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, mobile pho photography was on the rise, and I started like documenting my bike rides with a new point and shoot called an iPhone. Ooh, right here. And I think this is the actual iPhone I used to use. It has a crack screen and everything. I don't know if you can see it, um, but it was great. You know, you put this in your jersey pocket and just like take photos of like what's happening around you. Um, bum, bum, bum. sorry, I messed up my notes. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I'm like now, you know, sharing my daily bike adventures on social media and I'm meeting like and connecting with other bikey folks from all over. And it was pretty awesome. Um, I'm also lugging my DSLR to cross races and like working on like racing photos. So as bikes and photography coalesced, um, so did my appreciation, appreciation for the outdoors and sports photography. You know, these were things that I had never considered for myself, but now my interest was peaked. And so, like, every, after every bike ride, I would come home or go to my desk and be like, huh, I wonder what it'd be like to be an adventure photographer. So in 2014, my husband and I decided it was time to leave the Bay Area. You know, we had bo both been there for over a decade and we were changing, the city was changing, and you know, it was just time to move on. Um, so we did a bunch of research, we visited a bunch of places and ultimately decided on Portland. Why? Because of bikes. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, got re I was really obsessed with cyclocross and I knew that cyclocross was big here. Um, I heard these epic stories about rain and mud and sometimes snow, and it's coming from like dry ass California. That sounded really fun to me, um, and you know I think I might have over romanticized it in my head a bit, but you know nonetheless, bikes is what brought me here to Portland. So when I got here, I got a full time job at a little studio called Need More Designs. And after a year and a half of working there, I came to the re realization that like, I wasn't really happy with graphic design. And the truth is, for years, I actually struggled with the process of design and found myself miserable every time I was in front of the computer. Now, this doesn't mean I was bad at design or like I sucked at my job. Um, it's just that I, I wasn't happy with it. Um, I'm really proud of all the work I did, but it just wasn't as fun as I thought it would be. 
So like many of you who are logged on today, I used to attend a bunch of creative mornings. I'd go to like different design conferences, different like speaker events, and every time I went, they would always talk about taking a leap of faith, take, you know, take risk, seek your passion, you know, do what makes you happy. And you know, some of these creatives were switching careers later in life. So, you know, there I was, I think I was 34 at the time, and I had worked my ass off in graphic design, and I really wasn't happy. You know, so I took this as a sign that maybe it was time for me to shift gears and pursue what I'm really passionate about, photography, right? Um, because if I don't do this now, will I ever? And you know, I really figured that if I failed at photography, I would always have graphic design to fall back on, but I really wouldn't know unless I tried. So with the help of local career coach, um, Mary Blaylock, who is a 52 Limited alum, um, we put together sort of a rough plan of action of how I would um, pursue pro photography professionally and put my notice in at Needmore. Um, and luckily, the folks at Needmore, you know, they're really cool, super understanding, and they agreed to hire me back on as a freelance photographer, you know, hiring me whenever they needed photography work. And so these are a couple of the images I've done for them. Um, we still work together today, it's great. So in the beginning stages of my photo career, um, I actually took a bunch of remote freelance design work to help pay the bills and fund my business startup. Um, and some of these business startup costs were like investing in better camera gear, lighting gear, and also taking workshops. You know, I knew if I wanted to go pro, I would have to really get serious about the business side of photography and tackle my weaknesses as a photographer. So, you know, as part of this plan, I took a commercial photography business class at the New Space, New, New Space, New Space Center of Photography here in town but it no longer existed, it no longer exists. It closed a couple years ago, sadly. Um, you know, I got my feet wet with agreements and contracts, model releases, like all this like very not fun paperwork. Um, I got legit and set up a business, uh, set up a little LLC and registered my business with um, the city of Portland. And I also became a member of the ASMP, the American Society of Media Photographers. Um, back when I was a graphic designer, um, being an AIGA member, the American Institute of Graphic Arts, was really beneficial to my career early on. So I figured um, joining this professional association would be helpful for me as a photographer. And so far, it has been. Um, as an ASMP member, you have access to like all these resources surrounding legalities and all that like not very fun paperwork. And also, you get um, discounts um, to help with your business. So in addition to you know, working on the businessy side of things, I also needed to up my photography game. Um, I used to rely a lot on natural light or had someone do all the lighting for me, but if I wanted to be legit, I needed to know how to do that my own, on my own. Um, I also like, needed to develop a style of my own. You know, I, needed to, I know that I needed to like, stand out, and I didn't, want, I didn't want my work to look like everyone else's. Um, I also wanted to work on like posing different body types and um, you know practice or like get better at action photography and like really I just all my photography really needed to be better if not more um, amazing. <laughs> so you know like as a side note like I am still constantly learning and pushing myself today. I haven't figured everything out and you just like you know you just never stop learning. So. As part of going pro, I needed, I needed to figure out what kind of photographer I was going to be and how exactly I was going to stand out. Now, it's no secret that everyone is a photographer these days and everyone owns a nice camera and blah, blah, this and that. And, you know, this is like a very common complaint you hear in the photography community. So, you know, I really needed to make sure that I was not going to be just another person with a nice camera. Um, one night, I met a photographer at a party and who just moved here from New York, and I just told him I quit my job to pursue photography full time, and he's like, well, what kind of photography do you want to do? And I was like, well, I think it'd be pretty cool to shoot adventures. And he's like, nah. Um, no one wants to see your friends in nature. Nobody is going to pay you to do that. And, like, that stung. Like, but 
I wasn't surprised by it, and part of me actually felt that it was true. And like, like quick side note, this guy is really awesome. He's actually really amazing at lighting, and like I assisted him for a while. I don't think there was any ill will from him. It's just that he was being, like, giving me like tough love advice, you know. Um, but going back to why, you know, I thought this it was like true. Um, you know, out of all the forms of photography, adventure seemed like the most unattainable for me. Partly because there was barely any representation of barely any representation of people of color in this industry, you know, with the exception of Jimmy Chin. And he's like scaling giant mountains and doing things that are like super epic. And like, I think that's all cool, but like that's not the kind of photography I wanna do, you know? Um, so when I was looking at all the photographers, like, you know, on the West Coast doing the things that I wanted to do, um, you know, it turns out it's a very male, industry and that's not surprising but you know specifically it's a white male industry and even going down even more specific it's a tall white male industry so for me like I'm a petite Asian American woman like I did not see myself in this space at all I barely saw any women um, and if there were women again they were like white women and so it's just like I don't know I don't I, I don't know how I'm gonna make this happen like I don't you know I don't see people like me doing this so I took a very practical look at my goals and decided like the whole bikes and adventure thing would be like like a passion project or like you know be like you know just passion stuff and then if I wanted to make money I would focus on portraits and um, lifestyle photography and food photography you know those things were things that like or genres that like I was very excited about and like I knew that I didn't want to like photograph everything like I wasn't going to shoot weddings and in and architecture or real estate any of that like I wanted to work with people and like cool products and food so I set up basically like two personas I've got like this adventure side and then like the studio side um and you know the two styles of photography are very different so that's why I needed to like you know separate them out um, as I started marketing myself and like going to portfolio reviews and sharing my work on social media and meeting more people here in town, the job started to roll in. Um, slowly but surely, they were coming in, both for the studio work and for the adventure work. And I was pretty excited about that, and I still am. <laughs> so. You know, backing up a bit, I kind of want to talk about my move to Portland and how living here has made me really look at race and racism under a new lens. You know, I had spent my entire life growing up um, surrounded by diversity. My childhood was spent like in a working class neighborhood, primarily of black, Latino, and Asian families. And living in San Francisco, I was surrounded by people from all over the world. So when I moved here six years ago, and I was the only person of color on my block, I thought that was really fucking weird. And not in that cute, like, keep Portland weird kind of way, but in the what is going on here? You know, this isn't like some small, tiny town in the, like, in the middle of nowhere. Like, this is a city. Um, and I quickly learned about Oregon's messed up history, um, or I should say fucked up history, that really still impacts the black community, t community today. Um, you know, growing up, I had always been hyper aware of racism and knew that it existed. But the move here really made me dig deeper, and I started learning more about implicit biases and like other anti racist concepts. So, you know, made me dig deeper, like looking at my upbringing and looking at how these things impact cycling. In 2016, I met a really awesome Asian American cyclist and designer from New York um, who just moved out here from New York named Molly Sugar. And we'd go on these bike rides and talk about our, dis you know, just kind of like, yeah, just talk about a lot about the continuing lack of diversity in cycling. And so from these discussions, we decided to form Friends on Bikes, um, a community for women, trans, femme, non binary folks of color who like to ride. You know, and at the core of it, it was really like a way for us to create space and for us to connect with other folks of color who like riding bikes and who wanted to go on adventures together. Um, this is an image from one of the bike packing trips that we um, planned. Um, you know, 
But unfortunately, my time as a co-founder and organizer was cut short as this was also the time I was transitioning careers, I was freelancing, I was juggling a bunch of things, and it became really overwhelming and challenging to do all that. So, you know, I had to step away, um, and that sucked. Um, but through my time with friends on on front with friends on bikes, I really like learned about the importance of representation and creating space. So as I was trying to figure out what kind of photographer I was going to be and like what my role in life was going to be, you know, I thought maybe I can help change what the conventional views of cycling and the outdoors looks like. Because you know, for so long, this is like the mainstream idea of like what cycling is. It's just like mostly white guys in tight spandex like doing the Tour de France or this is from the Tour of California. You know, and you know, these guys, they're, they're talented at what they do, but there are other people who ride bikes, like these folks, you know? Um, so yeah, so I de decided like as a photographer, this is what I'm gonna focus on. I'm gonna prioritize BIPOC because you know what? Diversity is a must for me and it's not a plus. So I am currently in the thick of it. And to be honest, like it really took me a while to get used to saying this, but um, whenever people ask what I do, I can confidently tell them I'm a photographer and not feel like an imposter. You know, I really feel like I'm living the dream. And so I kind of want to go over the realities of li living the dream, both the good and the harsh realities. You know, first off, the bike and outdoor industry does not pay well. This is not unique to just the bike industry and outdoor industry. I think this happens all over, like, especially if you're a photographer, but it's still a problem nonetheless. Like, you, we shouldn't have to deal with this. Like, rates between brands and companies like, vi like vary wildly. And it can be really frustrating, especially when you're working with a big corporate go global br brand. Wow, that's a tongue tie, tongue. <laughs> anyway, working with a big corporate brand, like it's, it was really surprising like seeing how much or how low they were willing to pay, you know, photographers and talent. Um, you know, especially, like, I get really sensitive with talent, and, like, um, sometimes, I mean, a lot of times I'm asked to help find talent, and if you don't know what talent is, it means models, writers, you know, for a photo shoot, um, and for me, because I always, like, like, always ask my BIPOC friends first um, if they wanted to do this photo shoot, and, you know, sometimes people just offer like a really low rate and it's like you know you're using these people's images to like sell your product for like you know and like pay them you know pay me like i'm you're asking me to go out there and do all this stuff like pay me a fair rate pay us all a fair rate you know it's like for all you you know and for like small like mom and pop shops like i'm not going to be like as like you know um, harsh and y'all like they're actually better about this stuff but the big brands you know who you are like do better um, you know like as a an example I put together an estimate for a commercial job and like you know this brand was like cool can we pay you in gear and I'm like no I don't want to be paying in gear like your carbon fiber handlebar is not gonna pay my rent like you know like that doesn't help me. I don't need this thing. Like I need, I need to pay my bills. So, you know, that's frustrating and you have to deal with it. Like that's the reality of this job. Um, another reality is that it is a physically demanding job. And a lot of times I'm really exhausted after work. It, it's not like that bad a reality, you know, it's not that harsh, but like, you know, it's still exhausting. Um, I have to train and stay in shape in order to keep up with athletes. Um, you know, this image here, this is from the WTF Bike Explorer Gravel Camp that happened um, in February. Um, this is a four-day training camp. We're riding anywhere between 30 to 50, 30 to like 60 miles a day with a lot of elevation gain on gravel. Um, the organizer, Sarah, she's the woman right there with the blue and red, she asked me in December if I wanted to photograph the camp and I said yes of course but then I realized like I haven't been riding my bike you know it's winter here in Oregon um, and I also was recovering from an injury so I'm like oh, I have like two months to like get in decent shape to just you know be able to ride with these folks um, so yeah that's the reality of it too like and 
you know, it's not the worst again, um, but I do, ha I find that like I have to find this balance between what, like writing for work and writing for myself. So the good, let's talk about the good stuff now. I, unlike graphic design, I absolutely love what I do. I love working with people and interacting with people and that like I get to ride bikes and like shoot in very like really beautiful places. Um, you know, I, and even though like I just harked on it being very physical, I actually do love that like it's, it is physical um, and you know that I'm moving and I'm not just stuck at a desk all day long. Um, I'd love to also go over some like, like legit G dream come true uh, uh, moments that have happened. Um, so last year, one of my image of Kaylee Kornhauser um, was on the cover of Bicycling Magazine. Um, you know, I had been a reader of this magazine for years and like really enjoyed the photography and I was just, so I was just really stoked with one when I got the assignment to photograph her, but then when they decided to like run this image of her on the cover, um, yeah, I'm still like really speechless. Uh, you know, and part of it too is like, again, we're challenging this view of what cycling looks like, you know, and so this is really special. She's um, really like, a, a body positive activist in the cycling community. Um, if you haven't picked up this issue, I highly recommend it. Um, another like super exciting thing that happened is that I have an image in Oprah Magazine. Um, I, you know, I never would have dreamed in a million years that like I would be like have anything to do with Oprah. So this is really exciting. Um, here it is. I hope you could see it. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And you know, this is really special to me for many reasons. One, this image was taken in the Painted Hills, which is out in central, eastern central Oregon. It's about three and a half hours away from here. It is super beautiful. Um, if you haven't been, I highly recommend it. It's like a miniature Utah. There's a lot of cool geography, um, a lot of really beautiful gravel roads and paved roads, roads <laughs> to ride. And if you're not into riding bikes, there's hiking too. Like there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Um, but most importantly, it's the image of itself. It's three like super diverse women riding bikes in the outdoors, um, adventuring. And you know, for that, like we are, you know, defying, like again, challenging what cycling looks like. And it looks like this, you know? Um, and so like to my photographer friend who told me like, no one wants to see your friends in nature, you know, really, it turns out they do. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, dream come true. <laughs> so, you know, my, my dream of doing this, like, really can, like, be a reality without all the people who've helped me out throughout the years. Um, you know, from my, like, old design colleagues to friends and all the people I've met here to, like, the athletes that I work with, the talent that I work with, I'm, like, super grateful for all the folks who have, like, just come out and helped me and who've just been really awesome. Um, you know, I know I harked on that this is a very male-dominated industry, and it is, but there are some really cool photographers who, I've, um, who have connected with. I'm very grateful for these male photographers who are in my life. They've been very supportive and very welcoming. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's not as, like, I'm just, yeah, I'm just really grateful. Um, and through the magic of Instagram, I've also been able to um, connect with other female photographers who are in this space as well. So some end notes. Um, if you are someone like me who was is looking to switch careers, or you know you you maybe you want to try photography, you know, or maybe you want to try riding bikes or try some new sports. Try sorry, try a, a new sport. Um, got some advice for you. Um, first and foremost, believe in yourself. Believe that you can do this. Secondly, you know, you have to put yourself out there. I know that sounds really, really scary, but you need to do it. If you don't try, you won't know, you know? Um, note that like you might fall, but you just get back and you keep trying. Um, you keep practicing and you keep pedaling and eventually you'll get to where you wanna be. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>